Hey, welcome to another episode of Code Hour. This is going to be one on an introduction to cross-platform build automation in C Sharp using Cake. And because I've given this presentation before in front of a live audience, last most recently last weekend to a local code camp, um, it's much more fun to give it to a live audience. And so I'm going to try something a little bit crazy uh, tonight. I'm going to try being both the presenter and the audience. Yeah, so could be this could be really interesting, this could be really good, or it could be a complete disaster. We'll just have to see how it goes. Feel free to write in on the comments and let me know what you think about the format. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and let my alter ego disappear and get right into the content. So first of all, this is a introduction about Cake, but uh, I should probably get started with a little bit of introduction about who I am. I know my regular audience here on the YouTube channel knows this already, but I am going to do it anyway. So you can skip through this. Uh, just go ahead and fall asleep. So, and I'll wake you back up. I'll, I'll scream real loud when it's time to get back into the main content. So, my name is Lee Richardson. I am on Twitter, and generally if you follow me, I'll follow you back, although uh, if you tweet about sports or politics, maybe not so much. Um, I'm on YouTube, as you probably know, because you're watching this on YouTube, I guess. So yes, I have a YouTube channel. I have other great content as well as things about cross-platform build automation in C-sharp. I've got a bunch of Xamarin content. This used to be the Xamarin Code Hour, and I've kind of expanded it as time has gone on. And I've also got uh, a number, I've got like a really good one that was very popular on Xamarin versus Ionic. And I'm gonna do other fun ones in the future. I blog at LeeRichardson.com. I did a, a good blog that was uh, just uh, last week on uh, the importance of uh, putting make-like scripts, all of your CI logic into make-like scripts. I'd encourage you to check that one out. Whatever. Anyway, I'm also on LinkedIn. But, uh, oh, oh, and you may know me as the Siren of Shame guy. I can't help giving a quick plug here. I have my uh, siren, although I've got to plug it in, so yeah, there, this, this actually does plug in and, and light up. But, but the quick plug here is this is a free open source piece of software that notifies you when the build breaks, which is cool, but it does way more than that. It's also gamification. And so it has a reputation and an achievement system. So every time you pass a build, you get points. Every time you break the build, you lose points. And then some of the fun reputation uh, achievements that you can are, get are like if you uh, maintain a, a low build ratio, a uh, fail ratio, or if you decrease build times, um, or if you fix other people's broken build. Speaking of which, it also keeps track of stats. So there's one consecutive successful builds, the number of times you've checked in a build consecutively. So you can kind of compete against yourself to see how often you can, uh, how, how many times you can get a successful build. And here's a really cool one. There's the FSB points. You earn an FSB every time you fix someone else's broken build. Because how often does this happen to you? Build breaks and someone on your team is like, eh, Bob broke it. Bob's problem. Yeah. So <laughs> if that sounds familiar, one of the cool things about the FSB points, I've seen this work on teams where teams will actually compete against each other to try to get those FSB points. And the end result is that builds are broken for shorter periods of time because everyone is collaborating, trying to get, um, trying to use the gamification to encourage good behavior for continuous integration. So had to throw a quick plug in for there. Um, I also have a plug in for my uh, people who employ me uh, full time. Uh, Inferno Red, they're a great company. They're always looking for great content. They're 100% work from home, which is really cool. So, okay, uh, let's talk cake. So, uh, if you are doing, um, if, if you are a regular developer, actually, uh, let's, let's do a quick quiz. How many, how many here are uh, regular full time developers? How many people do part-time development and part-time build management? <laughs> uh, 
And how many people do we have that are full-time BMs? Ooh, it's a tough job being a BM. Okay, so if you're a full-time developer, you probably are used to just hitting F5 and hey, it works on my machine. Like, I don't understand why this DevOps stuff is so complicated. However, it is more complicated than that if you've not had to deal with a lot of this stuff. And so there is, uh, and this is the format this presentation is going to take. We've got compilation, testing, packaging, and deploying. Those are the four main categories of build automation. And so there's a lot of things that if you haven't had to do them, you might not consider. For example, when you're compilation, when you're doing your compilation, you might very well need to do spr spritifying. You might need to spritify all of your images, take all a bunch of individual images and combine them into one. Or you might need to minify. You might need to do obfuscation or what else do we have? Um, minifying, spriting, versioning. Versioning is a huge thing. Uh, the things in bold I'm going to go over tonight, how to do those in Cake. If you're doing testing, there's not just unit testing, but there's also integration testing and there's UI testing. There's calculating code coverage, which I'm going to get into also tonight, and static analysis. Um, as far as packaging, you've got code signing that you might deal, deal with. If you've got desktop applications, web deploy, if you're doing web packages, uh, release notes kind of applies to everything and documentation as well. And then you might also need to deploy using say Octopus Deploy if you're using a tool like that or Hockey App if you have mobile apps like Xamarin Apps like a lot of the other content on tonight's uh, on, on the, the channel here. You might need to do zipping, database migrations, notifications, FTP, secure FTP, all of these things are concerns that as a regular developer you don't have to care very much about. So that is an overview of the DevOps problem and uh, we've got some alternatives. So why do, why, why do we even need to use Cake? Why, why don't we just deploy by hand? I guess it's risky. Well, uh, how about, what, what are some good reasons? I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask the audience here, what are some good reasons why you might not want to deploy by hand because it's all on one computer yes those are all those are all good reasons so uh, things I have here are it's not consistent so it's not going to potentially be the same every single time you do it uh, it's not repeatable so uh, same thing as I maybe it's the same word as consistent uh, risky uh, maybe that's also the problem with consistency. Uh, single point of failure is a big one though. What happens if the build manager goes on vacation? That could be a big problem and that machine that he or she regularly deploys from is potentially also a single point of failure. That's one machine that if that machine breaks you could be in trouble. Um, and here's a subtle one. It is also very time-consuming to deploy by hand. It takes a lot more effort. If you just run a script and it just does it all, um, are you more likely to do it more often or less often? I would argue you're likely to do it more often. And if it involves a lot of right clicking and doing this and doing that, maybe following some instructions or maybe not, you're liable to do it less frequently. And there is a huge benefit to being able to do your deploys uh, frequently. That is, uh, there's, that, you know, that's why, that's what Netflix does and GitHub does. Those are, those are best practices. So another alternative is you could just write bash scripts. You could just write bash scripts or PowerShell scripts. Why not do that? Uh, maybe exception handling is hard. <laughs> no idea. Uh, well, how about this? So in this example, you got an A and a B and a C and a D. Now, what happens if you want to run all of those and you just run the script? No big deal. What happens if you just want to run C? I guess you could modify your script and take C out, but this is a problem that is um, has been solved for a long time. It, 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 it turns out there's a way of dealing with this kind of thing called dependency tracking, and this was originally solved in 1970, uh, oh man, I'm going to have to jump through my slides, 1976. <laughs> this was originally sold in 1976 by Stuart Feldman using the Make system. And the idea was, instead of having a, a bunch of scripts, we could have individual 
depend, uh, tasks and, and we can lay out what the dependencies for those tasks are. And so if we want to run D, we know that we need to run C and A and B. But if we just want to run C, well, the dependency, it turns out there's a hidden dependency on A. So we can, because we have it tracked using a dependency tracking system, the system can know to run A and then C. Incidentally, it's also smart enough that if I say D, it doesn't try to run A twice because C is dependent on A and B is dependent on A. So that is what Cake brings to the table, but all of the Ake-like systems do as well. So uh, I like history, I like, love technology, and I always think it's fun to combine these two into a, into a sort of a history uh, chart. And so in 1976, Stuart Feldman introduced make and the idea was to solve this problem of dependency tracking and so it looked uh, make looks sort of like this where in this example we have uh, all which is what you do if you don't pass any parameters and it's going to run compile and compile is dependent on clean and clean goes down here and it does its thing and then we go back up to compile and so those are your dependencies uh, those are your tasks and your dependencies and this was a uh, and still is a great system. It's just it's not cross-platform. It only runs on it only runs on uh, POSIX systems. It only runs on Unix anyway. So uh, so it took what um, like 20 years or whatever, but eventually someone came up with something uh, better. I guess uh, Cake uh, or sorry uh, Ant was introduced in 2000. This is what Ant looks like. And you'll notice that you have things like a, a default project, and it, the default project runs compile, and compile is dependent on clean, so clean goes back up here, and then that does its thing, and then this completes its thing, and then we go back up. So that's similar, but it's all cross-platform because it was written primarily for Java. And so, um, so yay, that's so much better, right? Yeah, well, it's XML, so yeah, I mean, I guess that's that's cool. Um, but it is cross-platform, and that's really nice. So jump up to relatively recent times, and there is a very large uh, community around two other, especially in the .NET world. There's uh, Sake, which is, I believe how it's pronounced. It's P-S-A-K-E, which is introduced in 2008, and that is the PowerShell make system or whatever and then there's fake which is the F sharp make system um, and and so these have been very popular until 2014 which was when Roslyn came out and the combination of Roslyn coming out and this uh, the creator of cake Patrick Svensson uh, was uh, he I, the story goes uh, that he was working on a project with fake and he um, because fake is in F sharp and the the primary code base was in C sharp, all of the developers on the project never wanted to to jump in and work on the F sharp part of because F sharp is weird and complicated and they and so he just ended up getting locked into this build manager position and uh, that was really frustrating for him and so um, that was the motivation for coming up with Cake and uh, the fact that Roslyn was reduced. At, introduced in the same time frame meant that uh, Patrick could come up with this C-sharp based make-like system and because all of the dependencies are in NuGet it is uh, there's a, a very large ecosystem of plugins I'll get into that later but anyway great tool and um, but but there's one more there's one more option there's one more option you could be using um, this is the history of the ache-like systems, but you could also just not use any of the ache-like systems and, and you could just put all of your logic on the CI server. So this is a VSTS, but it could just as easily be Jenkins or Team City or whatnot. What are the disadvantages with this? Documentation is not very good. Maybe it's hard to read. Hard to debug. Right on. So yeah, the disadvantages I list uh, here are vendor lock-in. So you're stuck with just uh, VSTS. And this was a problem for me recently because I was on a project where I had to change, we built our original uh, CI DevOps pipeline 
And then the InfoSec group was like, whoa, 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 no, you're not allowed to do it in this environment. You have to do it in this other environment. So we ended up having to rewrite the entire DevOps pipeline. And, uh, and we had all of our logic in CI tasks like this. And so we had to build it all over again in a different CI system. That was frustrating. And then a year later, they did it again. InfoSec was like, no, 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 no. You need to build it all in this. And so uh, we were like, no, no more of this. We are rebuilding it all this time in a make-like system, in, in this case, Cake, because we wanted to be able to, if they ever changed their mind yet again, we wanted to be able to take those scripts and just swap them in and out of a different CI server or uh, in the cloud or on-premise easily. And that so far has worked out well. Um, the, another major issue with having all of your logic on a CI server like this is that the it's hard to debug. Um, frequently, you uh, need to have well, you, you usually have to have a bunch of dependencies on this, and so you've got to wait for all of your dependencies to to run. So, like if you're doing testing here, you have to wait for this to run, and this to run, and this to run, and this to run, and before you get down to the, the testing. Whereas if you're running it in an ache like system, you, you like you can if you know all those runs, you can just kind of temporarily disable them um, if you've got a cached version of whatever their output is on disk. So you can get into individual things much more easily, and uh, you can also just set breakpoints in Make in or sorry in Cake. You can just set a breakpoint just like in Visual Studio and watch the debugger. You know, oh disappeared. Well, watch the debugger get to a specific point and then you can evaluate what your local variables are and what the actual values are and that is extremely powerful. That is a really handy thing. Um, not less thing is that it is not source controlled and so if you if if you want to do a blame because you know that's the kind of thing I do all the time uh, you do a blame and then you find out of course uh, it was me that wrote that crappy line of code, but still a very handy thing to be able to do is to do blames um, or git bisect. Git bisect is pretty awesome too. Okay, so those are all of the alternatives. Cake, this is kind of roughly what it looks like. You've got tasks. Uh, this may look a little bit weird. You have to squint at it to see that it's C-sharp, but it is. We'll get into the details later. And it is cross-platform. It runs on Windows and it runs on uh, Mac and it runs on Unix, it runs on all POSIX systems. And so that's really, really cool. I'll demo that later in the presentation. And uh, then there's also add-ins. And if you go to their website, by the way, the documentation is excellent. So um, that is really the next place to get started after uh, finishing out this, this presentation. Uh, but they have a whole huge list of categories including Docker and databases and CMake and CDN. Um, the, the list just goes on and on and it, the reason that it's so large is because anytime anyone adds a new plugin they just publish it up to uh, they publish it up to NuGet and then it becomes available to the community. It's that easy and so um, yeah, that's really awesome. And and the, over on the left here, by the way, these are just the categories. So the categories go on and on. And within each of those, there are sometimes multiple plugins. Okay, all right. That was the summary. Let's get into the basics of Cake. First of all, IDEs. You could, if you wanted to, use Visual Studio. And Visual Studio is a pretty reasonable way to do it. You do get color coding. Um, you got to install this Cake extension here. And the Cake extension will give you it'll give you code coloring, and it'll give you integration with the task runner and the debugger, and that's really nice. Um, but what it doesn't give you is it doesn't give you IntelliSense, or at least I haven't been able to find a way to make that happen yet. Probably the best way to run to work with Cake is in Visual Studio Code, and so if you use Visual Studio regularly, it's a uh, like I find myself sometimes having a, an instance of Visual Studio, an instance of, of uh, Cake, uh, an, an instance of Visual Studio Code side by side, and Visual Studio Code is just for editing the Cake files. So, um, and part of the reason that it's so great is you get uh, IntelliSense uh, sometimes, usually. You get syntax highlighting, and so the syntax highlighting will give you little red squiggles over there, and that's, that's kind of nice. You get commands, so there's a whole bunch of commands. I'll go over those in more detail. You get 
debugging. So I mentioned that before. Uh, debugging still a little finicky, but um, hopefully I'll have a demo for you later. And there's a task runner. I don't use the task runner, but it's there. If you want to be able to run your tasks through the IDE rather than from the command line, you can do that. Um, and snippets. And snippets will make uh, generating code a little bit easier. Okay, uh, we could get into how it works. We could do a demo. Um, let's just do a little bit more how, how it works. So there's uh, there is a bootstrapper. So you've got to have a in this case a PowerShell if you're on Windows or a PS uh, or a .sh file uh, uh, if you're on Mac a Bash script if you're on Mac and or Unix. And then once you run that initial one, if you run it for the very first time, it goes and downloads NuGet. It needs NuGet because Cake itself lives in uh, the NuGet internets. <laughs> uh, and so it needs to be able to have the uh, NuGet.exe in order to download uh, the Cake, the Cake dependency from NuGet. Um, it puts all of these in the tools directory and then any other plugins that you uh, that you need to download will also go generally into the tools directory. You can configure where that is, incidentally, if you need to, in the uh, packages.config file. And then the build.cake file is going to be the main file that you generally put all of your code into. Okay, we've gone on for 20 minutes and haven't even seen cake work. Let's get into Let's get into this. So I have a real simple project here, and this project doesn't do much. I've got a, um, this is a program.cs. Okay, so this is just going to, uh, this was my code camp that I did. Oh, we're gonna say hello to uh, YouTube audience. There we go. And now I'm going to want to run all of this from the, from the command line. So I need to install Cake. The very first thing you need to do in order to install Cake from Visual Studio Code is to install the extensions. You need the C Sharp one and you need the Cake one. Okay. In order to do that, you normally just go over to the extensions folder and type in Cake. Boom, there we go. So you'd click that. You'd click install, and then you normally need to restart your IDE. There will be a restart button there. I've already done that. Once you've done that, whoops, I don't care about references. Once you've done that, then you can go over to commands, and I do a con control shift P, but I think you can also just do it from task. Uh, you know, however you, however you do it without using the keyboard shortcuts. So uh, anyway, uh, that would be Command Shift P on Mac. And once you do that, you can type in cake and you'll see all of the cake options available to you. So the plugin gives you, you can install a sample build file, which will give you cake.build with some stuff in it. You can install a bootstrapper. Um, that would be your PowerShell and bash scripts. You can install a configuration file, which is optional, you don't need to. Uh, debug dependencies will give you the ability to step breakpoints. IntelliSense support is a whole separate thing, which will give you the ability to, well, you know, get IntelliSense. Uh, or you could install to workspace, which is what I'm going to do. Install to workspace just does all of it. Say, like, I want all of it. Just make it happen. So it's giving me a couple options here. Do I want to install it as, oh, by the way, I might, my code is probably too, should I make this a little bigger? Is that, is that better? Ooh, it's kind of big. <laughs> All right, if you're on a mobile device, maybe that'll be readable. Do I want to install bootstrappers? Yeah, sure. The cake config file? Yeah, whatever, sure. Do I want to install the dependencies needed for debugging? Yeah, I definitely want that. Okay, and if I go over here to source control, I think we're going to see... Oh, there we go. We're going to have a build.cake that was added. We've got our bootstrappers, PowerShell, Bash, and the cake config file, and oh, I did modify my program.cs just now. Um, so if we go over to build.cake, which incidentally is going to be located in the root directory, build.cake over there, 
Uh, let's just I don't know, get, get rid of all of that. Yeah, let's just get rid of all. Okay, so let's just do a hello world now. So to do that, we need a task. And notice when I type task here, I get my code completion, auto completion, whatever that's called. So in this case, I'd love to have a task, a, a cake task with an action. That'd be real handy. And I'll call this hello reasonable thing to call a low world type app. And then down here, I'm gonna run, and uh, I should have gotten IntelliSense, and I didn't. So sometimes what you need to do is you need to just close and reopen the whole thing. So I'm gonna close this. Oh, don't do whatever that was. And <laughs> I'm going to run code. We are going to run. Oh, come on. Don't make a liar out of me. Run. Wait for it. Wait for it. No suggestions. Oh, really will give you IntelliSense. I swear. Run. Run target. We're going to run the, yeah, hello. Maybe, maybe I think these are all errors related to the fact that I ran this once upon a time, I ran this on a Mac and I'm actually running all of this in Dropbox and there are problems that get created when you run the same code on a Mac and then you try to run it again on a PC. And I bet that this is gonna start working now. Oh, yes. Wait, 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 wait. Oh, it has to not see one. No. Let's go in here and do... We're going to do information, hello, world, semicolon, and we then will want to... I want to be in the terminal. There we go. Okay, and now we're going to dot slash build dot ps one. Preparing to run the build script. So what's this going to output? Oh, hey, there we go. <laughs> Hello world. Boy, that took longer than it should. <laughs> All right. Let's let's get back to the the primary presentation. Yeah, yeah. Oh no. Oh, oh, there we go. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for bearing with me. Okay. So in this case, uh, we have. I just showed you just the intro, a little bit of the the bootstrapper, at least the PowerShell one. And I wanted to point out here in pink that you want to you can change this file to fit your needs. So why would you ever do that? The one reason you might is if you're running in a world without an internet connection, then you might want to be able to download the nuget.exe from a file share or something like that within your within your organization. So that's the kind of thing you might want to modify that bootstrapper for. By the way, has anyone read this book? The little schemer? Mm. Nope. Not me. Well, I was forced to read it a long time ago, and I actually absolutely loved it. It's about uh, it, it teaches you how to uh, teaches you about a, a language called Scheme, which is a dialect of Lisp. And the thing that I loved about this book, and it's a classic book, because it was all done in terms of questions and answers, questions and answers, questions and answers, and so. Um, it never actually formally taught you anything, but it forced you to think about everything along the way. And so that's kind of what I'd like to do with this presentation. I've already been asking questions, and it was kind of the the idea behind having a, uh, an audience and a presenter version of me. And so this uh, this is going to be how I'm going to do the the next section of this of this presentation. We'll just do some some question and answer. So this is an easy one. What does this do? Uh, Prince Hello Cake. Uh, right on. Yes. Yes, it does. Okay. And there we go. Hello Cake. Okay. Here's a little trickier one now. What does this do? It prints compiling and then testing. Aha. Yes. Yes. In this case, it will run 
the dependent task because of the is dependent on over here. And so because it's is dependent on compile, it runs up here and runs compiling, and then it runs testing. Let's double check. Compiling, then testing. Cool. OK, how about arguments? Let's start learning about arguments. What is this going to do? It's going to run compiling. Right on. Yeah, yeah, it sure is. We're going to go up here to target. We're going to pass in that minus target, which is here, is equal to compile. And so the value compile will go into this variable down here, and it'll go down here, and we're going to run target called compile. And so it's going to go up here, and it's going to say compiling. So instead of saying it's not going to skip testing, it's just going to do compiling, because that was the parameter that we passed in. Boom, compiling. OK, cool. How about this? We're going to remove the argument altogether. What is this going to output? Um, just testing. Yeah, sure is. Because we didn't pass anything, the second parameter here turns out to be what we're going to do. This is like uh, first or default in C sharp link. And so the value default, because we didn't pass anything, is going to go in here to the target. Uh, into the target variable, and then when we run target, it's going to run the uh, default, and it's going to go up here, and then we're going to get testing. Testing. All right. Let's see. What is this going to do? No idea. Hmm. This is a trick question. If anybody figures this out, Pause. If you figure this out, I'll be deeply, deeply impressed. The answer is you get a compilation error. And the reason this is a compilation error is because the second parameter over here wasn't specified. And so it didn't even make it into the runtime because the Rosalind caught the compiler error ahead of time because it could not infer the type from the usage. So typically, this is argument of t string. And when we were passing in that second parameter, we were passing it in as a string. And so it knew, it inferred that the type of the default parameter is a string. But if you don't specify that, then it can't figure out what type it is. And so you have to do, you have to specify in angle brackets what type you want it is. And the reason I threw the slide in, I just want to point out that cake is still under the covers. Um, it looks like maybe it's dynamic, but it's not. It is still a strongly typed, compiled language. OK, so this is the correct solution. We want to pass in string as a parameter. OK, what is this going to output? I guess the current directory and the path. Uh-huh. Yeah, it is. It's going to output the dir equals, and then the dir is the zero working directory, and the working directory uh, up here. So it'll be like you know c colon temp or whatever directory. And then the path will be whatever the environment variable the path is. So that's a big long string of, of your path. This isn't super useful here, but I wanted to point out that there's multiple different ways of doing things in Cake. And so this is an alternative way to do the same thing. In fact, the stuff below it is the more common way to do it. But I wanted to show that context.environment.workingdirectory is a cake alias, which is synonymous with the uh, running into the, uh, it's synonymous with system.io.directory.getCurrentDirectory. Sound familiar? It should, because that's just .NET Framework. And so often, a lot of these things which are in Cake are actually things out of the .NET framework. Now, how about this? Context.environment variables path. I just wanted to show that this is actually the more common way of doing it, just environment variable. And if you're wondering where environment variable comes from, it is a method, one of many aliases, which is provided by Cake. And an alias is a extension method off of the context object. And the context object is this sort of globally available object, which is 
it's sort of omnipresent and um, you can write extension methods off of it and part of the cake DSL, the cake domain specific language, is that it, when you write extension methods off of it, it defaults to the context object. And so if you write an extension method off of the context object, then it becomes available just like this environment variable. And I'll show an example of this later. Last thing here is the debug statement. And I just, I guess, I just want to throw this in to show that this is what is the more common way of doing it, debug, and you pass in stuff. But this is what it's, um, it, it's an alias for, which is context.log that right now, all this like stuff. Yeah, you probably don't need to worry too much about it, but I just want to show there's multiple ways of doing things, and they generally involve the context object. All right, fantastic. We've made it through build. We are ready to get into compilation. Compilation. Um, is it ready for time for a demo oh, yes. yet? Maybe, I mean, I could show all this in presentation form, but wouldn't it be much more cool just to show it in a demo form? So let's do, let's do that. Do it. So this is, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to handle with this, this level of zoom or not, but. So what we want to do here is I ran this previously at some point and I've got a bunch of stuff sitting around in my release directory. So I really need a nice clean task, something which is going to delete all of the cruft that was built from the last time, that was hanging around from the last time potentially. And so we're going to do a task called clean. Actually, we're going to do a task with action called clean. And, uh, oh, and we probably should, remember that parameter passing stuff? That is very typical. We should really do that too. So we should say var target equals, still not working, grr, argument target, and we'll pass the default value default, which is always a good place to get started. And the, when we're gonna run target, we're gonna run target that was defined up here. This is pretty pretty common. Pretty much every single cake does that. Uh, cake file does that does this thing so that you can specify what the task is that you want to run. And so, uh, well, I don't think we need this hello here anymore. We can get rid of that. And inside of clean, there is an alias, and um, it's in the documentation. Like all this stuff, the documentation is fantastic in cake. So, just trust me. There's a thing called clean, and and when IntelliSense is actually working, then uh, it's a lot easier to find this, discover this stuff too. So clean, clean directories, star star slash bin slash, and then I guess we need a configuration. So clar configuration equals, oops, we want a uh, configuration and maybe the default is release. So we could also run this in debug if we wanted to. Does this look familiar? The syntax with a star star? If you're not too into DevOpsy, this may be a little bit magical. Um, and I don't know if this originally came from Linux world or, or what, but this means like recurse through all of them, recurse through all of the directories. And once you've recursed through them all, then if you find any that look like slash bin slash, so if you find any bin uh, uh, directories named bin anywhere down under the depths of where we're currently running this from, then I want you to clean directories it. And clean directories will, um, will not delete the folder, it'll delete everything in it. And if it doesn't exist, it'll just not delete it. So that's kind of nice. It's actually really nice. So we're gonna delete all of our bin and obj directories and so let's try to run this what do you think this is going to do should i do minus target equals default just for completeness let's see what happens uh, don't you need target equals clean target default oh Uh, yeah, I actually wanted to run target. Yeah, there you go. Clean, how about that? Hey, 
Hey, got it right. Got it right. Okay, fan. Fantastic. So if this actually worked the way we expected to, then yes. All right, everything was deleted out of that release directory, but it's still into the debug directory because we didn't, that wasn't the configuration we specified. Okay, so clean works. Probably we ought to do a task for compilation. So let's build this thing. To do that, we run ms build. And that's what we do for .NET Core projects, which this is. Uh, also, it turns out you do this for .NET Framework projects as well. So we're going to specify the solution. So this would be cake sample.sln, which is this guy. We're going to run that solution file there. And so this is a, a common pattern here is that the, the final, or usually the second, I guess, in, in most cake scripts, parameter is going to be the list of options and it's just going to be like a new um, ms build settings and configuration equals configuration like that and if we run this now what do you think is this going to work sure target build like that might have actually worked. So if we go back here into the CMD bin release directory, release directory, yep, there it is. You're gonna see we've got, among other things, a cake sample.cmd.dll. How cool is that? No, we don't wanna open it, but we might wanna to try to run it. And so to run it, we can do run.ps1 um, this is just a little uh, whatever. Ignore the ignore the man behind the curtain. But um, I'm going to run .net and let's see uh, from my current directory. I'm going to go to cmd. I'm going to go to bin release net core up 2.0 okay, sample.cmd.dll. So that's just going to run the .net core command line project, and we're going to see what it is. Woohoo! Hello, YouTube audience. This DL was compiled at 5, 16, 12, 38. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it is late. Okay, so that's that is uh, that's good stuff. It is actually twelve thirteen a.m. in the morning, and I should probably go to sleep at some point. <laughs> okay, so now that worked. Here's the question: Do you think this will work on a Mac? Am I lying to you that this is actually cross-platform? Yes, you are lying. I might be. Let's find out. So I happen to have a connection to my Mac open over here, and I will I will log into my Mac, and I'm going to be able to see the exact same file because it's in Dropbox that I was just working in. So I ought to be able to. What do you think? What do you think would happen? If I were to go and run this exact command here, I have to remember to hit Alt C because that's Command C. Okay. What do you think is going to happen? If I .NET CMD bin release cake .sample cakesample.cmd.dll. If I run that right now, that's the same DLL, the exact same DLL which was just compiled on Windows. Will it work? Uh, sure. Sure. The answer is it's not going to work. And um, the error message isn't one that I would have expected. It's complaining about a dependency. And I believe the reason is because the dependency was downloaded for a PC and not downloaded for a Mac. But in any event, the bits are not the same. It's just, it's not gonna run, it's not gonna work. When you compile that .NET Core on a Mac and when you compile it on a DC, D PC, it's gonna give you different bits. So we're gonna need to recompile it. So, Let's run 
build.cake. So you might be tempted to run dot stop slash build dot uh, build dot sh. Yeah, dude, build dot sh. Oop, there we go. Minus task equals uh, what was it compiled? I think. Um, Build that cake right here. Oh, target. Minus target equals compile. Oh, not compile, build. This is an interesting error. If I was a Linux expert, I would probably do a chmod uh, minus 666 or something like that um, to give all of the permissions. But uh, since this since this dot sh file was created on a mat on a PC and then imported through Dropbox, it didn't get the right permissions. So, but this gives me a great opportunity to show you that I can delete <laughs> to show you that I know how to delete. Okay, I don't know how to delete. Uh, <laughs> rm build.sh. Oops. rm. There we go. Build.sh should be gone now. Yep, that disappeared. Um, and so what I can do is I can bring that back in with a. Apple Shift P, and then I can install a bootstrapper, and it's going to give me the option of which one I want. I want the bash one, and yay, it's going to download build.sh right there, and the correct permissions will be on it this time. So let's try this again. Oh, no. This is going to do a clean. It's going to do a build in. We got an error. Why did we get an error? We got an error because we need to run a NuGet package restore. We kind of got lucky on the PC and the NuGet dependencies just worked, but that is no good. What we actually need to do is remember to always, before you do a build, do a NuGet restore. And so, fortunately, the Mac caught the error correctly, and we can do this the correct way to do a task. And we're going to do a restore. And here, I'm going to do a .NET Core Restore, save that, and rerun it. Oh, that's not going to work, is it? Wait, wait, stop. We forgot is dependent on. So here we go. Build is dependent on restore, and you know, actually, restore is dependent on clean. That is a much nicer and more correct way of doing things. So now, when we say build, There we go. That looks a little better. It's doing a clean. It's doing a restore. Now it's doing a build. The build is looking a lot better. And then when we go to run this, it will have the bits 
for a Mac on it, not the bits for a PC. And things should be a lot better. So we're going to go over to, now we can run that. There we go, run .NET and DLL. Hello, YouTube audience. And this was compiled at 12.21 PM. So there we go. All right, Mac, I'm done with you. Turns out I did not lie to you all that Cake actually is cross-platform. Let's get back into the presentation. Now I'm gonna have problems with getting this to run full screen again, right? Oh, it just worked. How about that? So you've already seen some of this in the demonstration, but uh, here are the build task. We're gonna see that we're running MS build and um, in a lot of the documentation, you'll see references to uh, .NET build and X build. Um, don't use those, just use MS build. That's the latest way to do it. So um, you might get errors like this. So we already saw this uh, about the NuGet package restore and the NuGet package restore can be fixed by doing a .NET Core Restore if you're running on .NET Core. If you're on .NET Framework, you want to run NuGet Restore. That's the Windows version of this. And uh, yeah, I guess I want, to, I want to point out, just take a quick aside and point out what this is doing is it's in the background or the alternative, if you, if you weren't using Cake, if you're doing this from the command line, the alternative would be to manually go and download NuGet EXE or embed it in your like libs directory or something like that. And then uh, concatenate strings together to make your commands work. And uh, there's nothing wrong with that, but it's just, uh, it sort of slows you down. And I, I find this again and again with Cake. There's so many things that it just speeds you up on. Sure, you could do it all manually, but um, it makes things an awful lot easier. Who's here? Her, uh, who here has heard of Git version? No? Oh, okay. Git version's great. It's a really cool tool. It allows you to automatically figure out what the version ought to be, particularly if you're using if you're already using Git flow and you're using Git, obviously, then it will figure out what the version ought to be. So here's an example. If you're on the master branch and you add a tag called v0.2.0, then Git version will return 0.2.0 and the semantic version 0.2.0 because it's going to figure that out from the tag. Now, if you create a branch from master called feature, for example, it's going to figure out that the version should be updated is not the major, not the minor, but the revision number because you are doing a, um, because you're probably doing a hotfix. So that's cool. And it'll figure out the semantic version in this case, feature 1.1. That's kind of cool. Um, then when you bring that back to the master branch, when you merge your hotfix back in, it knows to update your master to 0 0.2.1.0. So that's kind of, that's kind of cool. And then when you go back to your dev branch, it knows that you probably are adding more substantial features than just a hotfix, and so it automatically updates your minor revision number, and it does that just based on the fact that it goes back to the last tag in, in master. That's really cool. And then if you go off and do feature branches, it keeps the 030, but it starts using these uh, semantic versions. So if you were to do a if you were to do like an ad hoc build directly from a feature branch, it would give it a distinctive name in the semantic version. Really cool tool. And I just want to point out how easy it is to use a tool like this in Cake. So in Cake, you do a hashtag to get a preprocessor directive. The preprocessor directives allow you to pull down additional content. In this case, we're doing a tool preprocessor directive. And then you can run the git version command and pass it git version settings. Um, and one of the parameters that you can pass is update assembly info equals true. And if you do that, it'll recurse down into your directory and look for all of the assembly info.cs files. And whenever it finds them, it'll update the version inside of those to 
whatever you just saw on the previous slide is it, whatever it thinks is appropriate. And if you just wanted to throw tags on every, all, all the branches, you could just do that too. But it's pretty good. Now, you might think you're done at this point, and you would be done if you were in the .NET framework world, but when you're in the .NET core, it turns out that there's some kind of interesting things that I learned about the .NET core that I didn't know about. One of which is the versions are built into the csproj files inside of .NET core. Instead of the way they used to be done is they were just in the assembly and without CS file manually done by a developer. So the, what this means is that when you compile .NET Core, this version information here in the csproj file gets code generated out into an assembly info.cs, and so it will conflict, and you'll get a compiler error if you're using git version. So this is just kind of, it's kind of an interesting uh, aside about how it works, and you can fix this by this putting in this attribute here, generate assembly info equals false. And that will turn off when .NET Core compiles, outputting the assembly info version information, and it'll just use the one from get a version. So that's, that's kind of cool. By the way, here's a question. In this preprocessor directive, notice that I specified the version number directly in the string here. Why would you do that? Because uh, if you put the if you fail to put the version in, then on the server, it could download a new version and that would break things um, unexpectedly on the server. And that would happen while you're on vacation and um, it would be absolutely uh, terrible. Yep, you got it. That is exactly right. Okay, um, what is this doing? We've got an add-in to Cake NPM. Okay, I'm gonna speed up at this point. I'm gonna speed up and I'll just, I want this presentation not to be like all of the details of how everything works. I just want it to be kind of like an overview and to show you from here on out kind of like what the possibilities and what the sort of patterns are with Cake. So in this case, I just want to show you that there is a cake.npm plugin, uh, add-in that you can use. And in this case, it gives you the ability to do an npm install. What does that do? It does what you would think it would do. It does an npm install and that will download all of your NPM dependencies if you're on a web project. How about this? What is this going to do? NPM run. Bingo. Yes, NPM run build prod. And so if you had something like this, if you had a package.json with a scripts and you had a build prod in it, it would run this build prod. In this case, ng build minus minus prod minus minus uh, ahead of time compilation. I'm doing this on my current project. Um, and it's worth noting while we're in the general category of compilation that you can do modifications to Xamarin files as well. So if you're doing iOS and you have an info plist, you know, it's that file with like all of the information about your iOS project, you can go in and modify things like the bundle version or the bundle identifier. What that allows you to do is if you had a version of your app in user acceptance testing, you could have a different name for it. If it was compiled, if it was compiled in the UAT build definition or whatever, then you can compile it with a different name, or a different background color, or a different version number than it would be in the dev branch. So that's kind of cool, and you can do the same thing in Android. These are just plugins which are available to much more easily modify the files. You could do a search and replace just as almost as easily, but these plugins make it pretty pretty convenient. Whew, okay, we've covered the summary, we've covered the basics, we've covered the compile, we're ready for the testing, packaging, and deploying, which will go much faster. Except for unit testing. That'll take just a little bit longer. Uh, so let's talk about unit testing. Unit testing is a first-class citizen in .NET Core, which is really cool. And so there is this command here, .NET Core test. .NET Core test. Um, takes uh, a configuration, and here's an option. Why do you think this says no build? Yeah, no idea. Well, the answer is because .NET Core has built in a concept of unit testing, um, that means it's going to try to do the compilation for you as part of that 
default command. And the problem with that is imagine you have um, a, 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 a task which is dependent on unit testing, but it's also dependent on another task, and that other task is also is also dependent on compile. So you have multiple dependencies going on. You could very easily find yourself in a situation where the unit test task is doing a compilation and Cake is doing a compilation in a separate task. I'm a big fan of allowing Cake to be responsible for all of your dependencies. And to that end, if you say no build equals true and you have is dependent on build, then Cake has got all the smarts to know whether or not to deduplify, dedupe de, de your uh, tasks. So there you go. See, the problem is that this presentation is a lot of code. It's a bit dry, so you know, got to throw in just a little bit of entertainment value. Let's talk. Code coverage. So code coverage is a fantastic way to... How, how many of you all use code coverage? Yeah. Stats. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Code coverage is a wonderful tool for encouraging your team to um, care about the quality of their uh, unit testing. Now, you could use OpenCover. OpenCover is a sweet tool, and there's this is the, uh, the plugin up here, package equals open, open cover, and uh, that's a pretty reasonable way to do it. You could also, if you're using X unit or N unit, you could also say that you'd like VS test to do your unit testing, uh, to do your code coverage. And that works pretty well too, but the weird thing about, it's not weird, but the way you get it to work is you have a test adapter. And a test adapter is a thing that knows how to translate X unit or N unit into VS test. So you don't actually have to use VS test uh, for real. You can just um, pretend to be using VS test from VS test's perspective. So that's kind of cool. And to get that, you import a tool called, uh, in this case, xunit.runner.visualstudio. And while well, this is for xunit, uh, n unit is pretty much the same thing. And so, um, by the way, this is a tool. This, this is a different preprocessor directive, and it's because it's not giving us any extra aliases. It's just bringing in um, things on the command line. And the thing that's bringing on the command line is tools xunit.runner.visualstudio.231.build slash common zero, whatever. The important thing here is that if you specify this magic string down here and this magic tool directory up here, then you can use VS test with xunit and you can say I'd like to output trx file and then, oh, and I'd like to enable code coverage equals true and it'll just give you the code coverage and that works, right? Sure. Uh, that's what it should do, because you're going to get these dot .coverage files over here, and when you open them up, ooh, empty results generated. No binaries were instrumented. Um, if you've tried to get code coverage before from the command line, this will be a common error. So the solution in .NET Core world, incidentally, and I'm going to have a blog post on this in more detail, but is you need to include the Microsoft.CodeCoverage NuGet package in your test unit test project. And that solves it, right? Oh, no, it still does an empty results generated. No binaries are instrumented. So this is an interesting little thing that I learned about .NET Core when I was preparing for this presentation, and that is .NET Core has a different set of PDBs. You know those PDBs, the things which provide all of the debug information? Completely different set of PDB files than uh, .NET Framework. And then because of that, all of the code coverage tools fail. And so you need to go in to your CS proj file and tell it to use the uh, debug type full. And it goes in and uses the old file format for PDB files. And um, I think this may not work on a Mac, but it does work on a PC. And you can get, uh, you can get the format which is compatible with getting code coverage. And then, doo -doo 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 -doo, we finally get our, our TRX file, our coverage.coverage .coverage file shows us the code coverage for our project. And that's fantastic. Then you can go into VSTS or your favorite unit, uh, uh, your favorite CI server, and you can publish the test results, specify that TRX file, and maybe you specify the coverage somewhere too. By the way, 
quick aside, this is pretty much my ideal CI server build environment. Instead of having a whole bunch of these individual little tasks, I just have one run cake. Make it happen. It makes me very happy. And then you end up with this. But um, you get code coverage, and uh, we can see that we have a 62% code coverage. And what's this green number over here? That is one of the things I love about VSTS, which is it shows you trends. Because what's the ideal code coverage number? 80%. Think again. 90%. Nope. The ideal code coverage number is better than last time. And that's what this okay. is showing you. So that's kind of cool. OK, let's cover packaging, code signing. So I do this with Siren of Shame, because if you don't, if you don't do uh, signing, if you don't sign your uh, MSIs or whatever, then when you install them on Windows, you get this big warning, and it's annoying, and then things are terrible. So if you give a little bit of money to someone somewhere on the internet, then they'll give you a, uh, and, and give them your passport and your, you know, social security number and your bank account information and pretty much everything else, then they'll eventually give you a certificate and uh, it's a complicated and painful process, but eventually you can get a signing t tool. And I just wanted to point out that you can run, um, you don't even need a third party dependency. This is actually built into Cake. You just get a uh, sign file right here and you can pass in your sign tool settings and just it does the signing. So details aren't too important. I just want to show you that that was possible. So what is this doing? Get PR description. This was a plugin that I wrote for my project. And I just want to show that it was possible to write your own plugins. Um, it's probably not a best practice to include the DLL in your lib directory. Better off would be to put it in a NuGet package and download it through uh, a, pre a preprocessor, a better preprocessor directive like tool. But um, this does work, and uh, I just want to show how powerful it is. You can, uh, how easy it is to do. Attribute cake alias category. I guess that's required. You need a cake method alias, and then the most important thing is it's just a public static extension method, uh, which is extending off of the i cake context. What happens inside of my GitHub API get PR description from Git head tip? It doesn't matter. It's C sharp. I want to point out here that it's this easy to get into C sharp code when you're in Cake and you've got access to the full everything C sharp, and it compiles down and, and builds into Cake really easily. So that's what that's that's one quick solution if you find yourself in a situation where Cake is failing you for some reason. All right, what is this doing? Uh, it's creating a it's web a trick deploy question. package. I told you right up here. It creates a web deploy package in my project.web.host.bin release publish. Okay, it's dependent on a bunch of stuff. Um, the important thing here is that we are doing a .NET Core build, and um, this is just a pattern that you should be aware of. So, in if you are um, wanting to run a web deploy, create a web deploy package, you will need to um, put in some additional parameters, publish profile equals web package, and uh, deploy on build equals true, which might sound familiar if you've done much command line work. But the point here is that these things, publish profile and deploy on build, are would normally be parameters which you can find up here in the .NET Core build settings. But because they're Windows only, and because right now you can only deploy web, create web packages, as far as I know at least, on Windows, um, they didn't build it into the API, but you can you can still get into it using this pattern that is available on most Cake plugins, which is argument customization, and you get a lambda, and you can do additional stuff to add additional command line parameters. So that's a pattern that you may very well see and need. Okay, we're coming down the the final stretch. Deploying is the last thing I want to touch on. Hockey App is a wonderful tool from Microsoft for getting your um, iOS and Android builds out there. And there's a really nice plugin. I was using this on my last project. You can just specify your API, IPA and APK files and upload them to Hockey. 
and this works really nicely um, using the add-in cake.hockey app. There is not currently a App Center plugin as well. So if you want to run partially in uh, VSTS and partially in App Center, eh, you probably have to write your own plugin. But this is the only thing that I've really noticed so far that's not in Cake that I kind of would expect it to be. So, but maybe by the time you're watching this, it's there. Who knows? <laughs> All right. How about this? Uh, what is this going to do? This is there comes out the code to deploy a website to actually do a deploy. So just wanted to point out that it is possible. This is the last thing I want to point out is that there are a bunch of aliases out there for all of the different CI, uh, all of the different CI servers. In this case, this is TFS. So if you do build system.tfbuild, there is a whole bunch of stuff in here, including like, am I currently running on TF build or am I running locally? Um, but one of them is .commands.upload artifact, and you can specify that I'd like to upload whatever it is, maybe my web deploy package, and uh, or a zip file, uh, maybe my database deploy migration package. So that's a thing you can do. All right. We've done it. This is the end of the presentation. Thank you for hanging out. Again, uh, my name is Lee Richardson. I hope you've enjoyed. I hope you've learned a little bit about uh, what Cake is and what it can do. And uh, hopefully I've convinced you that it is a great tool for your next build automation project. So if this has been useful, please do consider subscribing to the YouTube channel or check me out on Twitter and tell them, let me know whether you thought this was useful or not. So. Till next time, have a wonderful week.